Hello, new friends. Thank you for joining me today. Today I thought we'd look at this map and we can enjoy some nice paper sounds and crinkle sounds and take a look at a beautiful part of the country known as the Eastern Sierra region. I recently had the opportunity to spend about a week out here for vacation, not for work, very nice. So I thought we could take a little look at the trip and learn some new facts along the way. So, the Eastern Sierra region encompasses the highest and some other of the almost highest peaks in the contiguous U.S. It's also home to some very famous national parks like Sequoia, and Yosemite, and Kings Canyon, John Muir National Forest is here, and so if you live close enough to just drive there, that's excellent, but if you don't, get into the Eastern Sierras, albeit different parts are about equidistant from Los Angeles, so you could fly into Los Angeles. Or the San Francisco area up here, so you could fly into San Francisco. Though I'm pointing to the wrong place. San Francisco is actually a little higher, right up here. Um, so if you do the San Francisco route, you would come over through the mountains. And then if you come the Los Angeles route, you could take this road called 14 and then join up with 395. And this route, this 395 here, that is pretty much the heart of it all. And so in this one spot, there's a place called Owens Valley. It's in Inyo County. You can see the Owens River here. And it is an amazing, wild, just incredible place to be. Um, on one side of the valley, you have the Eastern Sierras some of the highest peaks in the country. And on the other side, you have what are called the White Mountains, which are also very high. And all of this area has really cool and interesting stuff to look at. Wonderful outdoor activities to pursue. So let's start our journey about right here, where we have 395. And we'll go up. Here we go. Do, do, do. And then it's not listed on this map here. But one of the first things that I did was go to a place called Fossil Falls. And Fossil Falls is this spectacular lava flow that's been sculpted by rushing water and wind, so the lava was a long time ago. And you've got this fairly flat walk out for about half a mile, and you just wonder what is going on, or how is it called Fossil Falls? And then it's like out of nowhere you come to this chasm, and the chasm has these drops, these steep drops that are like falls, so they're not really fossils but 
it's really cool and interesting to see. And all along here, there's just these mounds of old lava. Like you're just looking at it. So if you've been to the Big Island in Hawaii, it feels a little bit similar because you'll see the um, how the lava made the land. But this is different because it's not the whole of everything. There's just these huge rock piles that are actually lava. And there's a couple different kinds too. So that's interesting. So you've got huge rocky mountains on one side. And then you've got what looks like they're more like dirt mountains on the other side, but they have plenty of rock too. And these ones here are jagged from glaciers and wind and moisture. They get a lot more um, of the water over here. And these ones are a lot drier. And here you go out and there's just these rocks and dryness to be sudden, like vast, dramatic peaks. Just they seem to come out of nowhere. And on either side you might see some lava. And then on this side you have the other mountains too. And it's really fascinating when you drive up into them because you're just sort of going along, boom, boom, boom. And it just feels like this this flat trip and then you can't see it because you get close but all of a sudden you're in the mountain it's so interesting so after fossil falls there's a visitor center right around here the eastern sierra interagency visitor center there it is you can see it on the map by the way, to get to Fossil Falls is a dirt road, and a lot of things in this area are a dirt road. So if you're renting a car, rent appropriately. And if you're bringing your own car, plan appropriately. Anyway, at the Eastern Sierra Visitor Center, the kind of side edge of it um, looks right into the Eastern Sierras, and you have this view of Mount Whitney. Um, which is the tallest peak in the contiguous United States. And what's funny to me all from there is that the perspective is that Lone Pine Peak looks a little taller just because of how it's situated. And when you go just a couple miles up the road, you can really see the difference. Um, but Mount Whitney is 14,500 feet high and this is the part to me that's so amazing about this area and how the tectonic plates hit each other and how it caused some parts to go up and some to go down and how volcanoes came into it but this is Death Valley National Park and I didn't go there because it's roughly 1 billion degrees there in the summertime. So we didn't go there. It's a little bit of an estimate, but about that hot. Um, but the lowest place in North America is Badwater Basin in Death Valley. It is 282 feet below sea level. So from Mount Whitney over here, to Badland Basin over here, you drop effectively 15,000 feet in what straight distance is roughly 80 miles. And then it to, to drive it, it's more like, um, um, how much was it? Like 146 miles if you're going to hike down from the peak of Mount Whitney and then drive. But isn't that crazy that those two totally disparate elevations with this whole continent to be on are so close to one another. It just fascinates me. I mean, you could potentially start at the top of Mount Whitney, hike down, drive down from the portal, there's Mount Whitney, drive down, cross, come through, go over in one day. 
be a long day and a tiring day, but you could do it. There's also a lot of temperature change, which you need to be aware of, because it's real chilly up here and real hot down here. And for people who aren't used to high mountain desert, there's a huge change between highs and lows. So you can top out over 100 during the day and get down into the 60s at night. Um, and of course, usually if you live in a place with high humidity, um, you won't see those kind of changes. The humidity is sort of holding the heat. So if you want to do the Whitney Portal Drive, uh, we didn't hike Mount Whitney. You have to get a special permit to do that ahead of time. It's a lottery system, I believe. But you can take this, what I really believe is a terrifying road, up to where we would start the hike to the peak of Mount Whitney. It's called the Whitney Portal Road. It's very windy. The views are spectacular, but there is nothing to protect you. There is no shoulder. There is no guardrails. Uh, there is not really any place to turn around. There's a couple little pullouts, but it's very narrow. And the people who are used to it tend to drive very quickly. Um, and don't seem to appreciate people not driving as quickly. Um, so, just a little tidbit there. But it's a heck of a view, I'll tell you that. Okay. Oh, and that peak, if you wanted to go up there, um, just where the portal is, is 8,374 feet above sea level. So you would drive up to that in a very short amount of time. And then if you want to hike the extra 6,000 some odd feet up to the peak, I think it's about a 10 mile hike from there. So you'd have to go up and back, obviously. Um, but a good place to do all that from is this little town here called Lone Pine. It's got like 2,500 people and a few motels few places to eat. I'll tell you, the eating along this road here on 395 is really good. Way better than you would imagine for the, um, the population of the area. So outside of Lone Pine, you can see Manzanar, the National Historic Site. And this was an internment camp during World War II, where the U.S. government, um, for people of Japanese heritage, um, it's free, which is good, so that price wouldn't stop anyone from learning about this. Not a proud moment. One thing they do really well that I appreciate is that they focus on the resilience of these people and the patriotism of these people who are being interned by their government and being interned for nothing. Um, is really interesting. So it doesn't focus all on negative stuff, though it is very difficult to visit, as I'm sure you can imagine. But there's a lot of hope there and inspiration there, too. It's really worth a stop. A lot of the um, the buildings are still there. Really interesting, really well done. So much information. So, you can also go up from there if you want to keep going. And again, just absolutely beautiful and incredible here. Let's see, is this 168? I think that's right. So you can take this highway 168 here, and you can go up, and you can see the ancient bristle columns. Now if you just look at them, the ancient bristle columns aren't particularly prepossessing. Kind of funny looking, not that tall, 
One interesting fact, they grow between 9,800 feet and 11,000 feet above sea level. So again, a very mountainous, very windy road. Not particularly safe feeling, but definitely better than a portal road, I'd say. Enjoyable, beautiful views. But here's the thing that makes them the most interesting. These trees are more than 4,000 years old. An estimate of one of them is that it is more than 5,000 years old and still living. They are the oldest living organisms on the planet. It is fascinating. One of the most interesting exhibits that I saw was a cross section of one of these trees, you know, like where, where it had died and they had cut it. Actually, one had it died first. One had been cut down at some point and used for a telephone pole back a long time ago, a telegraph pole, maybe. But anyway, they had these cross sections, right? And you can see the rings in the trees. And so if you've ever seen the giant sequoias over here, um, the redwoods, they're, they're huge and they're interesting to see um, with their many rings. But this ring, this exhibit showed what would have been going on when that ring was formed. So for instance, humans invent writing was one of the rings. Uh, Christ is born. The Roman Empire follows. So you get the idea. But these trees have been up there at these super high altitudes, just growing since before humans really wrote. And they're just still there. And you have to use your imagination a little to feel the wonder of it, but it's just crazy. Anyway, there's a few different ways you can do it if you want to go up. There's a vista area, and then there's a Shulman Grove Visitor Center you can go up into. These are in the White Mountains, by the way, over here. Um, and then from the Shulman thing, there's another, um, all that's paved. You can get all that on paved, albeit again, no guardrail, very windy roads. Um, and there's a Patriot Grove, and you can walk around and do little hikes in that area. Hikes even being a little bit of a strong word, a lot of them are pretty flat walks, realistically. But um, keep in mind, you'll be at very high elevations. Um, so if, if that's going to be a struggle for you with breathing, uh, make sure you have water and take rests and plan for it. But it's a heck of a view. It's different in the White Mountains than the Sierras because the Sierras are so sheer. You feel like you're at the edge and you just whoosh. Um, where the, the White Mountains feel a little more gentle, at least out on that particular road. So still high, still a long way to fall, but not quite as just edge drop um, as the other side. One of the things that I absolutely love about the high mountain desert is it's so quiet. It's so quiet. There aren't regular forests, so there aren't a lot of animals. There aren't birds singing in a lot of places. If the wind's not blowing and there's no one around, there's no sound at all. And if you haven't experienced that, it's really interesting because this quiet almost pushes on you. It pushes, you can feel like the weight of silence, if that makes sense. I think it might be your brain trying so hard to find some sound. But I think it's the most peaceful you can ever be. I really love it. It's about 11,000 feet high, by the way, if you want to go up to that Shulman Grove beyond from there. I mentioned the altitude. It's just worth keeping in mind. So from there, it's about 24, 
26 miles, something like that out. Look how that, and this makes it look like you're just like flat, but it's more like you come down like this. Um, and you can go up to this town called Bishop. Now, Bishop's an interesting town to me because it's got between three and 4,000 people in it by their last sign that says their population. But it feels bigger. It feels way bigger than the one with the pine, even though it's only about a thousand more people. But of course, that's a third more people, so depending on how you want to measure it. But I get the feeling that it's sort of the hub for the area. So there's like a nice hotel in Bishop that you can stay in with a creek that runs through it, and lots of restaurants really friendly people like all the way through here super friendly uh, but a lot of people stay in Bishop um, who are hiking and doing stuff in different places because it is the closest place um, to a lot of it and the nicest and the biggest and then the other thing especially if you're from somewhere not on the west coast I think for any of us who might come from other places, Mammoth might be what you hear about more, well, and of course Yosemite. Um, but Mammoth is big for skiing, so there's a lot of that up there. But anyway, you're in Bishop. It's a good place to stay. And they have a museum here called the Laws Railroad Museum, but it's not just railroads. Uh, it is at an old railroad place, and it was the first time I'd ever got to see a, um, a railroad turntable. We were back in the day when things weren't mechanized. Uh, they could drive this round with the tracks, and they could drive a train onto it. And then four men, if it was lined up right, could just turn an engine, a whole huge engine. And then it could drive that the other parts of the yard it needed to be in. But there's a lot of great history at the museum and you can see neat things. Um, so I enjoyed getting to see that. And then of course there's all kinds of day trips. There's hot springs, a lot of hot springs in this area. If you're interested in that, uh, it gets really hot in the summer. Not the hot springs, but the weather. So beware. And they can get tons of snow in the winter so just if you ever do want to do this trip just make sure that you're prepared for whatever might happen and then there's different roads um, for different trips out of Bishop but there's one and you go up and you can eat at a cafe that's like nine to ten thousand feet up in the mountains and there's a whole campground and cabins and stuff down to it. So you go up and there's this super friendly, super delicious place to get hamburgers. Here in the mountains. And it's so beautiful and quiet. And then in 30 minutes, you can be right back down in, not a city per se, but certainly a, a built up area. Though, I have to tell you, I still ponder about this. Nowhere in here does there seem to be like a, a grocery store chain that you might be used to or like a Target or Walmart or place where you get things. So I'm fascinated by what it'd be like to live and how long it would take to get to an airport um, if you're really just trying to get to the airport and not meandering and taking multiple days to not go very many miles. Okay. So let's leave now. Come back down. And let's say you wanted to end your trip in LA. Or maybe you started there. So you would come across on this road called 14, and if you have time, interesting places to stop first is Red Rock Canyon State Park. Now it's only a state park, but 
feel like Star Wars or anything that looks like it's on some other sort of rocky desert planet, you've got to stop and see this place. It was so hard to believe that I was still on Earth. It was incredible the way the wind and water had just made these pillars in the rock or holes in the rock. Um, again, that very, very quiet where there's no noise. It was really otherworldly. Look it up, maybe if you get a chance. It was incredible. And from the time I entered where it said, you've come to the state park, drove the map, drove up the road to the campground, uh, went past the abandoned ranger station. Um, yeah, never saw another person. No. Um, I think part of it is because in summer it's so hot, no one's crazy enough to be out there. But it was really interesting. I would love it. And I, we weren't there at night. But boy, I bet the stars are incredible. I'd like to see it. Um, and I think this is the one, this Jawbone Canyon uh, Visitor Center. It's interesting, they have a tortoise there. If this is the one I think it is, but it's somewhere right around here. Um, this tortoise has been alive for a very long time. He just lives outside the Visitor Center and he has a little shade house for him and come out and greet people. And it's this funny little Visitor Center. <laughs> There's not that much in there, and kind of feels like a warehouse. They sell World's Finest chocolate bars there, you guys remember those? When I was a kid, some schools would sell them for fundraisers. I didn't even know it was still a thing. Anyway, and then you can come down. Pretty much stay anywhere here in the LA area if you want to. We stayed in Pasadena because we went to the Huntington Art Galleries and Library and Gardens. Uh, this was our collection and endowments by the Huntingtons, and they have a Chinese garden and a Japanese garden and a subtropical garden, and a jungle garden, and a rose garden, and something called the Shakespeare Garden, which is really just a lawn with some statues. Um, and they have incredible works of art. Um, they have a Warhol. They have a Blue Boy. They have something I think called the Pink Lady that I'm not familiar with. They had some interesting modern art I enjoyed, including someone who was inspired by Jackson Pollock. His name escapes me now, the, the artist book they actually have, but I liked that painting. Um, if you like European Renaissance style portrait art, they have a whole, whole building just of that. It's not really my thing. I just kind of poked my head in and moved on from there. Um, but they also have a library uh, with exhibits with old books. So they have an actual Gutenberg Bible, which was cool to see. They have a first folio of Shakespeare's plays, which, you know, you're looking at it and it's just a book, but I think about how different the world would be if no one had captured all those plays and put them together and printed them so that they could keep going all this time. You know, how much we're influenced by Shakespeare and still watch his stuff today, and read his stuff today. Uh, there was a letter from George Washington actually written by him. Uh, I'm trying to think, there's lots of cool stuff. I know I'm forgetting some of the really neat things they had, but it was fantastic. And it's funny because it felt like such a refined day compared to being out here. Um, 
how you're basically dusty and dirty all the time. You can throw stuff in the washing places. Your car is dusty and dirty. Uh, but I like the Chinese and Japanese gardens a lot down here. There's other things to do along here, of course. Um, you know, Yosemite, all these places if you want to do that. Mammoth. Um, there's a place called Mono Lake. If you go a little farther north. Oh, here it is. Can you see that on there? It's right out of reach. Just like the trip itself. A little too high. Um, that has some cool geological things to look at. There's a place, um, I think I mentioned it earlier, called the Alabama Hills. They're kind of like the foothills of part of the Eastern Sierra, like where Mount Whitney is. Uh, but there's a road called Movie Road, because so many movies have been filmed in that area. There's a lot of rocks, and it looks like the Old West, and there'd be cowboys there. Um, Lone Pine actually became a very big place for movie stars to stay and film crews to stay as they were filming out here. But again, that's a dirt road to do movie road. It's not paved. But it does make a nice loop. You, it'll take you back to 395. You come a little off 395 to get to it and drive through and come out. Again, kind of an otherworldly feel. And then a strange feel because I feel like you've seen it on TV so many times. And what else? Oh, interesting um, exhibits from the Paiutes and Shoshones. They've been in this area for a very long time. You can learn more about them. Uh, they have a nice cultural center in Bishop, a little off the main drag. Um, and by that I mean a little off 395. But really, really interesting. There's just so much to do in what seems like such a remote area. And there's so much geologic history and diversity and coolness. Um, it was really exciting. And just the beauty and the awe of it. I love mountains. I don't know if some of you feel the same way. But I almost feel like when I'm looking up, and especially at rocky, jagged ones, they're lifting me up with them. I love it. Anyway, I'm sure I've rambled on enough for all of you. So if you made it this far, thank you for watching. I will not try to fold up this map. <laughs> because I'm sure that would be very unrelaxing. Especially as I finally just get terribly frustrated and crumple it up. Just kidding. Um, but it really was wonderful. I'd love to hear if you've been there or if you imagine that you super love.